and I, somebody else actually introduced him and said the good things about him, but then I got up and told some of the things he did when he was growing up. So he's expecting the worst today when he finds out I'm introducing him, but they told me what to say this time. So, so I'm just gonna read it. Uh, he is my brother, he was born on my birthday, so he stole my birthday, but I shared it with him. <laughs> uh, when I was two years old, he was my birthday present. Larry Sparks is a Cades Cove native, one of 12 children born to Asa and Amy Birchfield Sparks. His ancestors were among the first to own land and live in the Cove. His immediate family was forced to sell their land with the establishment of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the 1930s. But although most neighbors moved out, his family remained in the Cove as leaseholders until 1960, when Larry was 12 years of age. Larry graduated from University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and lives in Loudoun, Tennessee with his wife, Katie. He serves on the board of the Cades Cove Preservation Association and is a member of the First Families of Tennessee and as a resident, I'm sorry, as a descendant of Col Colonel John Tipton, he writes and presents Case Cove History. So I present to you Larry Sparks. <laughs> Thank you, sister. She has said some bad things. I told her some of my church members were coming, so she drink it up a little. I'm glad everybody came out today to brave the weather. I think one of the things that most Kate uh, knew not to say anything bad, she, uh, she knows I always have a backup plan when she does that uh, because I have a picture of her when she was a baby when I brought her home from the hospital. <laughs> We're going to have a story here on Granddaddy Tom Sparks and uh, We'll have some good uh, slides to show you. I'll actually move over out of the way though when that happens. Then we'll have some sweet mountain music by cousin Maddie Carpenter. <clears throat> so we'll have a Tom Sparks of Spencefield Herder. They said he would give up his bed to complete stranger, even on a cold rainy night when the smoky mountain wind was blowing on every corner of his little herder's cabin. And the fire in the fireplace was little more than a wet smoke. He gave up his bed to a stranger. That was my grandfather, John Thomas Sparks. I'm here to tell you the story of his life. His children called him Pat. His grandchildren called him Grandpa. Most others just called him Tom. I never met Tom Sparks, but it made it my business to know him just the same. I'm next to the last of his 48 grandchildren. Clear. Can you turn the volume up? On this? Okay, how's that? Test, yeah, test. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm next to the last of his 48 grandchildren. The last and youngest distinction goes to my brother Lane. Miss Denley. The number 46 grandchild, I won't mention her name, but she was born in 46. <laughs> I got to know Tom through my father Asa and stories by my aunts and cousins who knew him well. My Aunt Iva and Uncle Dan Myers would sit on our front porch and talk about him for hours on end. They could make the story seem like everything was lived out just last week. They recall yokes of steers by name and logging camps by the creeks they were on. And Granddaddy's dog was old Buck. Even strangers I've met have told me about knowing him once they learned my name and where I was from. I also learned a lot about him through stories written by respected writers such as Carson Brewer and Vic Wheels. Carson Brewer doing through visits at his Spitzfield cabin. You may have read some of those stories. 
It seems that Tom's life and death made it in about every Smoky Mountain writer's book. I must inform you, however, that our family has issues with made-up stories with cheap shots taken at him by local stunt blowers simply for the sake of selling a book to an unsuspecting buyer. Tom was a Spenceville herder and probably the best known of all Smoky Mountain herders. He was murdered in his cabin there in 1926. And yes, it was by a man whom he had given refuge and cooked dinner for just moments before he gunned Tom down in the doorway of his cabin. The shooter ran off the mountain and tried to hide behind a relative's door saying, I've just killed the best friend I ever had. Tom was killed by Earl Cameron the day after he had, the day after he had uh, told Cameron and two other men who were staying at his cabin that he didn't know which one of them was guilty, but one of them had stolen a wallet from his shirt pocket the night before while he slept. After confronting the three men, Tom left the mountain top, went home to his family where he told them about the theft. The next day, he gathered his usual food supply he referred to as grub, made what would be his last climb up Anthony Creek and Boat Mountain. Several family members went along so the children could pick service berries. They had no clue they were to witness Tom's death that very day. Once there, Tom began cooking for everyone to include Cameron. No mention was made of the missing wallet. After most had finished their meal, Cameron jumped to his feet and said, Uncle Tom, I didn't take your money. Then he grabbed a gun lying on the bed and shot very dead. Within 10 minutes, Tom was dead. My father was on the mountain with him when he was killed, but he was not in the cabin when he got shot. He and Fon's cable had gone to the nearby spring where they had delayed for a while to talk. There were some grandchildren still there in the cabin, however. My cousins Barney, Maud, and Buster Cable were there along with, and although just a small girl, Maud ran underneath the shooter's outreached arm and out the cabin door as he shot Granddaddy. I want to read you a script about his death from a handwritten note by his youngest daughter, my Aunt Nellie Sparks Chambers. Nellie was 23 at the time of his death. Hear these words. Earl Cameron killed Pat July the 16th, 1926. And he was buried July the 17th in the Methodist Church Cemetery. The Reverend John W. Oliver conducted the services. He was killed on Friday and buried on Saturday evening. He was killed on top of the mountain. He wasn't done eating his dinner when he got killed. He was 67 years old. He is gone but not forgotten. At 21, Tom married my grandmother, Hannah Whitehead. Hannah was 22. Her mother died when she was five. And she lost her father and was orphaned by the time she was seven. She was raised by grandparents in Blount County but not in Cates Cove, although she lived there after she married Tom in 1880 until her death in 1934. Tom and Hannah lived in a big two-story house with four porches on Sparks Lane in Cates Cove. Grapevines hung from the overhead trim on the front porch. They raised seven children there. John Taylor, Lucinda Jane, Bob, Ivan Emmeline, Frankie, Asa, and Nellie. They lost a son, Henry Russell, at two months of age. Their house side is plainly visible. Even today, it's on the west side of Sparks Lane. The outward appearance gives few clues to the past. There's some seats up here, and then they'll bring in some chairs, but there's seats up here. Thank you for coming. Maple Branch still runs by there every day on the way to Abrams Creek. To Daddy, this was simply the home place. 
and it was a part of her lease on Sparks Lane when I was growing up. Daddy seemed to always get by there when we were anywhere nearby checking on her cattle. It was usually just a quick walk through where the house stood. Almost always he would mention that this was his home place. <coughs> then move along slowly. He knew that yesterday was gone and he can't bring it back. Tom Sparks was known as a kind and generous man who shared with everyone. He grew big gardens, but his pride crop was going, growing lots of watermelons and giving most of them away to his neighbors. At his funeral, preacher John W. Oliver said that Tom would give away his last bushel of corn, not knowing where his next corn would come from. Tom was born in Cage Cove in 1859, the third child of Nathan and Jane Potter Sparks. He was just a child, two years old, when the Civil War broke out. After the next four years of his childhood, he'd see some very tough times. He saw his family struggle to survive the tyranny brought to Cage Cove by the Confederate bushwhackers as they came knocking down the doors of our Cage Cove people. They raided for guns, livestock, and food. Bedding and shoes were taken, and the human life meant even less. As has been written and recorded by many, Nathan and Jane were forced to sleep in the bushes every night with their children during most of the Civil War. Their house was raided on occasions, but we're told that Jane always managed to hide the children in a special place. Though through it all, Tom's parents, Nathan and Jane, raised 10 children and ended up owning most of the land in the east end of Cape Cove to include the popular mountain balls of Spencefield and Russellfield. The balls were made up of native grasses that grew in the rich fertile soil. The climate was a mild given that the elevations are about 5,000 feet. Perfect combination for lush pasture. These grasslands were used to graze their cattle, sheep, and hogs during the summer months. Other cattlemen's livestock was also pastured on these balls for a herder's feed. This feed provided Nathan and his sons with a good cash crop every year. An average summer saw 400 to 600 head of cattle, 75 to 100 head of mules and horses, and about 200 head of sheep grazing themselves fast over a four month period. <clears throat> Most cattle and horse stock were driven off the mountain by early September. The sheep and hogs were kept there much longer since they could feed on chestnuts and acorns late into the fall. As Nathan began dividing up his land holdings with his children who remained in the cove, Tom ended up with the Spitzfield. He continued the family tradition of herding livestock for other cattlemen. Some herds were driven there by drovers from as far away as Knoxville. Boat Mountain was the most common route to these mountain grasslands. In addition to herding cattle on the mountain, Tom and his brother Sam and George did a lot of logging and sawing. They were known for using long hitches of oxen to skid logs. At times, they would have as many as 10 steers hitched to one log. One of the most noteworthy logging operations they were involved in was the big steam engine sawmill at El Dorado on the headwaters of Hesse's Creek in 1905. Tom and Sam also had farms in the cove as did their brother's day. One of Tom's lasting deeds in the cove was joining with his brothers and sisters to start the annual Sparks family reunion in 1925, the year before his death. That reunion is still held every year. Daddy said that Pat killed a sheep for the first reunion, but was outdone by his brother George who killed a bear. Tom spent so many summers on Spitzfield that his name became synonymous with the place. 
He had made friends with not only cattlemen, but hunters, mountain hikers, and timber cutters in neighboring North Carolina. Tom even hosted a revival there once for the men of the nearby logging camps. <clears throat> Preacher John McCampbell of Tuckaleechee Cove conducted the services. Eagle Creek was the closest camp, but Fontana Village and Hazel Creek were not far away. Lumberjacks change jobs often, so they're always passing through the high mountain country on foot. Somehow, they managed to stop at Tom's cabin along their way. Early nature writers seemed to seek Tom out for stories and hospitality. If you hike in the mountains at all, you know that a warm fire and a shelter from the elements are always a welcome sight. A good mountain story makes it even better. Tom grew lots of cabbage, potatoes, and cucumbers. Tomatoes near his cabin. He was known for cooking hot meals in the Dutch oven. He fed anyone who happened in. I can almost taste the fried green tomatoes right now. In Daddy's words, he never turned anybody away. Tom told those who stopped by looking for a bed that he could always find room for one more. A large part of Tom's legend was built after he had to fight off an attack by a mountain lion or panther in 1920. The mountain people called them painters. Tom was checking on some misplaced sheep late in the year near dark and he heard a loud scream. A skiff of snow covered the ground and a cold night was moving in. Before he had taken time to think about the scream like for being a panther, he answered with a yell of his own. Shortly afterward, he saw a figure cross the path just ahead. Then he heard something in the leaves falling along above the trail but in the cover of brush. Tom was caught without a gun, so he took his big pocket knife out and had it ready. The panther attacked Tom by knocking him down from behind. But he was able to grab a front leg with one hand Stab his knife deep into the animal's shoulder with the other. The animal soon learned it had met a mountain man in Tom Sparks. The panther abandoned the fight and ran away. Tom was scratched up across his back and hit, but otherwise all right. Mark went up for the good shepherd. The next day, Tom summoned some bear hunters with dogs and attempted to track the panther. It had left considerable blood markings on the ground in the light snow, but the evidence soon faded and nothing was left to follow. That probably suited the dogs just fine. Several months later, and on an occasion when my father Asa was on the mountaintop with Tom, a bear hunter came by by the name of Will Orr and told Tom that he had killed his painter. Orr said that his dogs had treed the panther on Eagle Creek near Fontana. And he'd shot it out of the tree. The animal still had a, an old shoulder wound and it was in poor condition. The National Park Service still reports this as the last known panther attack in the Smokies. So the story stayed alive for 93 years now. Tom and those who helped him on Spence Field had many close call stories from those high mountain meadows. They hunted down and shot livestock killing bear, saw herds of cattle freeze to death in late spring snowfalls, and witnessed many mountain thunderstorms with dangerous lightning, killing large numbers of sheep and cattle. Huge timber blowdowns were also occurring then, just as they are now. Yet through all of these life-changing events on Spitz, at Spencefield on Tom's watch, the panther story remains at the forefront when discussing dangers on the mountains and missing persons in the high country. What is it with the panther? Is it the mystique of an elusive wildcat lurking in a forest? Is it their secret nature that brings about the intrigue and stirs our curiosity? 
and brings the question, is a panther still in those mountains? If you go looking, make sure you take along your pocket knife. <laughs> Granddaddy sold his beloved Spinsfield to John Martin before he was killed. But apparently worked out a deal to remain there as a herder. It has been said that Tom loved to talk of Smoky Mountain like nothing else. He must have learned herding from his Uncle Davis Potter, who herded Spencefield for Tom's father, Nathan. Uncle Davis spent 16 years herding there after returning to Cades Cove from the Civil War. Herding on a mountaintop was hard work. They had to pack lots of salt and other goods up the steep mountain trails on their back. Just how blessed was our family to own property on those mountaintops? Who could ask for more? Nathan and his brother James bought Spitzfield and Russellfield as a part of a 5,000 acre boundary from the J.T. Doyle Land Company when it was still cheap right after the Civil War. These records call for three miles on the Tennessee, North Carolina state line. The witness trees to mark the boundaries were white oaks and are likely still standing there today. It was used as grazed land by our family for at least 52 years. Then sold a few years before the National Park Service finally took it off. If you've never visited Spencefield, you may want to consider this place, putting this place on your bucket list. From the top of Spencefield, you can reach up and touch the sky or be a part of a passing cloud for just for a moment. Almost heaven. And you can still visit the cabin site of Tom Sparks. It's located just to the right of a little spring there as you face Fontana. And finally, you may see for yourself that, yes indeed, he gave up his bed for a stranger. Thank you very much. Of the 
wood He said we can mark a tree To keep from getting lost And it'll always point our way home Like that old rugged cross A hundred years and it just grew And only heaven knew just what it'd be Who'd hang on that tree it hailed the Son of God like it should But I know it broke the heart of the wood I think we'll make Granddaddy great Said he didn't work all day I love the time we'd spend And I go everywhere